You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Hyperice, the leader in advanced warm-up and recovery technology. They have tons of innovative products, like Venom heated wearables to help soothe sore back muscles, Normatec compression boots to speed up recovery and increase circulation, and Hypervolt massage guns to improve mobility. Loved by athletes like Naomi Osaka and Erling Holland. Try them yourself. Get 10% off your order with the code MOVE at hyperrice.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore dat am. Well, today we have a very simple objective. Prior to the break, we're going to talk about this game one last time. And I am completely lying when I tell you that I'm going to be completely unbiased, scientific, and objective. And then after the break, we're going to look at the other games, and I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in every single one of those games. To a T. I mean, to to the point. If there were fractional points, I would tell you to the fraction. 29 and a quarter. Three-eighths. I don't know. Let's get weird with it. Why does three-eighths even exist? Who needs three-eighths of something, by the way? To that, we're going to add three-eighths of sugar? No, we're not. No, we're not. Figure something else out. That's stupid. Would you like a quarter? Should we do a quarter? Three-eighths. Tell you what, we're doing a half a cup, and if this tastes bad, I'm never, I'm never, ever making your stuff again. Garbage. Rewrite the recipe. Be a man, all right? Coward. But uh, first of all, why don't we start off with the injury report for the Green Bay Packers. Chris Barnes is questionable for the day. Uh, A.J. Dillon uh, was limited participation. He's a full go, but he is injured with a back injury. Elton Jenkins, as I'm sure you know, is doubtful, still doubtful, very doubtful that he's going to play. Aaron Jones also injured, unfortunately, ankle injury. He's been limited all week. He was limited uh, Friday as well. So Dylan and Aaron Jones were limited on Friday. They're both playing, but just so you know, not spectacular news. Kevin King is doubtful with his concussion issues, which, um, you know, we talked about would Stokes or King play. At this point, he's been downgraded to doubtful, so... Um, Stokes is, Stokes is the guy. So I I don't want to get into the debate about whether we're better with King or without, you know, over Sullivan or whatever the case may be. The point is at the end of the day, these are meaningful reps for Eric Stokes. You know, one of the things that I had mentioned about the Packers and how slow they are to develop people is by virtue of being slow, they actually slow the process down. It may be mostly beneficial to the team by not putting a guy out there that doesn't know what he's doing. But at the end of the day, you've got guys, for example, the ultimate example here is Jordan Love. If Jordan Love had been playing this whole time, he would clearly be further ahead in his development than where he is now. And I'm not blaming the Packers because obviously it makes sense. I mean, that's a very exaggerated view of what we're talking about here, but that's what we're talking about. They're not pushing these guys out there because they're not ready and they're not panicked and they want to give them time to develop, but they're not developing anywhere near as fast as they would if they were actually playing these guys. So by King continually being hurt, which, you know, I think we all forget this, but he's he was very injury prone for a while. And again, a concussion, I don't know how much that's his fault, but we've seen this many times in the past, and now King is again injured. And um, in this case, it works to Stokes' benefit. And, and potentially to the Packers' benefit, again, I don't mean to be overly harsh on Kevin King, but at the end of the day, the Packers have some very tough decisions to make. And um, with King not playing at all, and Stokes potentially developing quite a bit, or at least learning and, and growing, it'll, it'll, even if he's not great, it's going to slowly increase the Packers' confidence in Eric Stokes because they know he's been out there, he's been battle-tested, et cetera, et cetera. So there won't be that panic reaction to say, you know what, maybe we give King a one-year deal. Unfortunately, we might be having that same conversation with Zadarius, but, you know, whatever. I mean, it, it does work for Rashawn. No more babying Rashawn. Now he has to play all the time. As much as I hate that Zedarius isn't playing, it is ultimately good for Rashad because it's put up or shut up time. You have to produce. That's it. No more hiding. No more excuses about limited sample sizes. Now is your opportunity to show the world that you're good. You've always been good. Go do it. And as impressive as he's been in terms of win rate, 
Nobody in the national media and 70% of the Packer fans do not care about win rate. You're going to hit the quarterback. You're going to get meaningful pressures that, you know, do things. And you're going to get sacks or nobody cares. Uh, Josh Myers has a finger injury, but he's been full participation all week, so he should be just fine. Vernon Scott has had a hamstring injury. He's been uh, limited all week. He is questionable for the day. MVS is out and uh, was, as we mentioned, put on short-term IR. Kind of a conflicting thing there because on one hand, they do have a bunch of wide receivers that are due contracts, and you have to assume several of them are not going to be sticking around again for all the same reasons. But at the same time, it really feels like the Packers have honed in on him being the actual wide receiver too. They really have have grown in their appreciation of him, and now he's hurt. And, And granted, being hurt isn't a death sentence, but it certainly helps you weed out and make decisions. If we're talking 50-50 and one guy's giving you full years and one guy's giving you half years, it's an easy decision to make. Finally, uh, defensive lineman Jack Heflin is uh, questionable today. Um, Didn't participate. uh, What does NL mean? They gave me a chart. I don't even know what that means. Not limited. I've never seen NL before. LP is limited participation. DNP is did not participate. FP is full participation. What the heck is NL? Not limited? I don't I don't know. I have no idea. But he's NL for Wednesday and Thursday and then limited on Friday. I mean, not limited means full participation, so I don't think that's it. No lemons. It's got to be like no or not, right? Not leeling good. Not limping anymore. It is an ankle injury, although A.J. Dillon had an NL on Wednesday and he has a back injury. No lie. Anyways, uh, Pittsburgh Steelers injuries. Chase Claypool, uh, let's see. Says he's questionable, but I'm pretty sure he's all the way out. I think that's the latest from Twitter. And so Ian Rappaport's great for this kind of stuff, but he posts so much. I, I'll see if I can find any updates to this, but I'm pretty sure Chase Claypool is out. And to, on top of that, Rashad Coward, offensive lineman, is out. Carlos Davis, the defensive lineman, is out. Chakuma Okorafor, the offensive lineman, is out with a concussion. Um, everybody else that's injured is full participation. But Alex Highsmith, groin injury, Deontay Johnson, wide receiver, knee injury, Ben Roethlisberger, quarterback, peck injury. Um, he didn't practice on Wednesday, but he was full Friday, uh, Thursday and Friday. Juju Smith-Schuster with a rib injury and TJ Watt with a groin injury. So, I mean, these are this team is pretty banged up. And I think we kind of forget about that sometimes. That's why I emphasized A.J. Dillon and Aaron Jones, even though they're playing, it stinks that they're injured because they're still injured. You know what I mean? And that's going to... It's going to take its toll. Not everybody's David Goggins. <laughs> Started doing audiobooks now, so you're going to get all kinds of stupid references. But I read David Goggins, read, listened to David, David Goggins' book. That dude's a psychopath. If you want some motivation, don't read his book, because it's it doesn't motivate you. It's just a story about a psycho. In, in a good way. I mean, he's a strong, strong guy, but I don't think anybody on the planet, maybe some people, but... I at no point was listening to that book like, I need to be more like him. I never want to be like him. He's talking about running ultra marathons, which I didn't even know existed. We're talking like over 100 miles, like 24-hour running. And he's talking about how he's like, he has broken shins, but he's got, well, I've only got 50 more miles to go, and he's running on broken legs. Okay, dude. Um, I respect you. No interest in being you, though. That's fine. I, I will, I, I'm fine not finishing or starting, for that matter, the race. I think the one good thing it does, though, is it <laughs> it provides a little bit of perspective. You know what I mean? Like, I'm never going to run that race. I'm never going to, um, you know, do things to the point of basically death and then say, well, if I die, I die and keep going. But at the same time, I'm able to look at my quote-unquote struggles and be like, okay, I think uh, I think I can reach this <laughs> level. Like, the garbage needs to go out. Hmm. Can I overcome this struggle or not? I don't know. What would Goggins do? He'd probably take it out. I don't know. Then again, he's probably still running, so he can't take it out. I don't know. I don't think he's ever stopped or doing pull-ups. I think he still owns the pull-up record because he did pull-ups until his hands became hamburger. Like, literally. Anyways, uh, it's an interesting story if you're interested in that kind of stuff. But again, it's... Not really motivation unless you want to be a Navy SEAL like three times and an Army Ranger and run hundreds of miles and do thousands of pull-ups, like 4,000 some odd pull-ups. 
if that's what you want to do, yeah, check out his book, man. He'll uh, he'll help you out. But yeah, they're they're uh, these normal human beings who are injured are probably. I mean, I shouldn't even call them normal. Obviously, they're they're beyond normal, but um, they're still to some level human, and injury is going to impact you in some way. So. Um, also, while we're at it, because we're not as familiar with the uh, Steelers roster as Steeler fans or as the Packers roster, I just want to go through and look at these guys in a little bit more zoomed in context of how much they matter. Obviously, we know Big Ben. He is playing, but you know we know who he is and how much that matters. Plus, it's a pec injury. I don't think that's like your major muscle group as a quarterback, but it's involved in throwing unless it's on the other side, but that would be random. What the heck is he doing with his left arm? But yes, it does look like Chase Claypool, according to Adam Schefter, at least is completely out. Um, Ian Rappaport downgraded to out. So there you go. He is out. At this particular point in time, again, we're not as familiar with this team. And I think this is the problem with some people who want to argue with me on Twitter about the Steelers and how great the Steelers are and how they're not as bad as I think. They still think this is like 2017. They still don't recognize that it, exact say, I don't want to repeat my exact speech about the 49ers. And this is obviously to a much lesser extent because people do recognize this is not as good of a team, but I don't think people recognize how much they've fallen. This is not Antonio Brown, Le'Veon Bell, Ben at his peak, Juju just emerging, one of the best offensive lines in football with this gritty smash mouth defense. That's not this team anymore. This is the 2021 Steelers, and like everybody else, we got to figure out who they are. Juju Smith-Schuster is not even the number one wide receiver on this team anymore because he has fallen into the depths of despair. Chase Claypool is the number one wide receiver in terms of how often he gets put on the field. He's the eighth most used player on the offense overall. Obviously, the offensive linemen are all out there every single snap. Ben Roethlisberger's out there every single snap. Um, And then Najee Harris is out there the most. As I read that PFF article to you, he's overused according to them. Their, their offense runs entirely too much through Najee Harris. Um, but outside of quarterback, running back, and offensive line, Chase Claypool, 158 snaps, is their number one wide receiver. Behind him is Juju with 140, James Washington with 93, Deontay Johnson tied with him at 93, Ray Ray McLeod at 51, and Cody White with nine snaps. Now this obviously is not Devontae Adams going out, but the point is When Devontae Adams goes out, the Packers can manage because they have Aaron Rodgers, because they have an offensive system that includes a lot of very good players and possibly the best quarterback in football, and they can make it work, not to mention a a very good offensive mind with our head coach and offensive coordinator. This is the Steelers, and you take a bad offense and you take their number one wide receiver away, it becomes even more problematic. If you look at it from a target standpoint, not just a snap count standpoint, because again, you could say, well, he's out there more, but he's not targeted as much. That's not true. Um, Chase Claypool is actually targeted more than Najee Harris. And last week, I think I was talking about how Najee Harris was targeted more than anybody last week, I think. I don't know, but he's, he's targeted a ton. He's, again, entirely overly used. Chase Claypool, 28 targets. Najee Harris, 27. Deontay Johnson, 22. Juju, 17. Fryermuth 10. Washington, 8. Ba 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 down the list we go. In terms of receptions, Najee's higher because he's a running back, so he's catching a lot of these easier swing passes. But still, Chase is number two, the number one wide receiver, and then it's Deontay and Juju. If you look at yards, um, it's a massive... I mean, it's crazy to me how much Chase is in the lead on this. Just in terms of wide receivers... Deontay Johnson is third in terms of total yards with 141. Chase Claypool, 211. Najee Harris is second with about 150. Yards per reception outside of Eric Ebron, who's essentially irrelevant, Chase Claypool is leading in yards per reception. So anyways, it's going to be a lot of Juju and a lot of Deontay Johnson, but Juju's doing a lot of slot work. So I have to think it's going to be Deontay Johnson and James Washington outside with Juju in the slot. So really, it's it's going to be James Washington is the guy that's going to have to step up even more. If we look at it in terms of percentages, Juju Smith-Schuster, um, 73% of his, 73.5% of his snaps have been in the slot. As far as the two offensive linemen that are out, uh, Rashad Coward has not played a single snap this year, so that's not a massive deal. I don't know how a guy that doesn't play gets hurt, but there you go. However, Mr. Chikwuma Okorafor is their starting right tackle. 
Now, is he good at football? No. He's given up the second most pressures of anybody on this team outside of Dan Moore, um, who is their left tackle. So the two tackles are already quite terrible. Um, Dan Moore, by the way, has given up 11 pressures in three games. That's awfully staggering. He's on pace to give up 62 pressures. I've never, I don't think I've ever heard of that. I Let's see what it was last year. Somebody had to have given up a ton. 58 was the record. However, one less game last year, but still, if he's doing three a game, 58, 59, 60, 61, he's still on pace to outpace Juwan Taylor, who gave up the most pressures last year. Juwan Taylor and Andrew Thomas, what a bunch of swing and a misses. Holy cow. So anyways, the, the left tackle for the Steelers right now is on pace to be worse in terms of pressures given up than any anybody last year. That's tackles, guards, and centers. Every single human being. Granted, it's mostly tackles. Again, as far as most pressures given up, it's tackles, then guards, then centers, um, generally speaking. In his place is going to be Joe Haig, I believe. He's played 33 snaps at right tackle in place of Chikumo Okorafor. Um, Zach Gentry, Gentry has also played a little bit, one snap, but I'm assuming they're going with Joe Haig. Joe Haig in his, um, let's see, 32 pass blocking attempts has given up one sack so far, one pressure. So he's already on the board having hardly played. By the way, this offensive line has given up 30 pressures so far this year. Shockingly, is not even close to the most. That's crazy. That's really crazy. What in the world is going on in the world? <laughs> uh, the, the Buffalo Bills have three people with at least 11 pressures. Joe Feliciano has given up 11. Daryl Williams has given up 12. Cody Ford... Another massive miss. Again, Buffalo's overrated with their drafting. 17 pressures in three games. What are you even doing with your life? They've given up 60 pressures. Anyways, um, yeah, losing your right tackle is, is probably problematic. And then finally, Carlos Davis, the defensive tackle that's out, is um, very low on the totem pole. He's... Uh, in terms of defensive linemen, it goes Cam Hayward, number one, Chris Wormley, number two, uh, Tyson Alualu, number three, Isaiah Bugs, number four, Isaiah Loudermilk, number five, and then Carlos Davis, who's had 17 snaps in three games. So it's not overly significant. Otherwise, again, everybody's, everybody's playing. But um, the right tackle and Chase Claypool, again, quite significant. But ultimately, it really doesn't matter because, again, Chase Claypool is not that good. He's mediocre at best. And uh, Chucky, at right tackle, is just bad at football. So it doesn't matter. I, again, I don't want to do the same spiel, but the team is one and two. They've played the Bills, the Raiders, and the Bengals. The only team that's any good in that group is the Buffalo Bills, and they had a week one just like we had a week one. Right, they imploded week one, and then they come back and smash Miami 35-0 and smash Washington 43-21. They're back on track. That's it. That's all it is. And we can pretend it's more than that, but it isn't. By the way, in that game, their offense still only scored 23 points. The only reason they won that game is because Buffalo's offense could not find anything. And the Steelers' defense kind of woke up a little bit. And the Steelers' defense is still not bad. I mean, 26 against the Raiders, 24 against the Bengals. That's fine. I mean, it's the Raiders and the Bengals, but you don't mind that if that's your defense. 12th overall defense, it's something. Unfortunately for them, they're going up against the first competent offense they've gone against all year. Again, if we assume Buffalo just hasn't, hadn't found their rhythm until week two. And the Packers officially woke up, you know, like one and a half weeks ago. And so you've got a team that scored 35 points against uh, De Detroit and then 30 points against San Francisco going against the 12th ranked defense. And uh, our Packers defense, who allowed 17 to the Lions, 28 to the 49ers, going up against the 28th ranked offense, who's only made it to 20 points one time, that was 23 points, and has only uh, gotten over 10 twice because of that, you know, super dominant Bengals defense. <laughs> Huh? What do you mean? The Bengals have done a good job. They haven't allowed a lot of points for by any team. Yeah, they played the Vikings, the Bears, the Steelers, and the Jaguars. They've had the cushiest schedule of anybody in history. By the way, they get to get spanked by the Packers next week, too. Then they get the Lions, and they can look impressive again, and then they're going to get spanked by the Ravens. And then they're impressive with the Jets again. They'll probably beat up on the Browns because it's a weird division thing, and everyone's going to pick the Browns, and the Browns will lose. But yeah, they'll probably have two losses going into their bye. 
And people are going to freak out and pretend that they're better than they are. You know, the team that just almost lost to the Jaguars. They're they're really good. We just, you know, just got to embrace it, I guess. But at the end of the day, this team, you know, sometimes it's not just about um, the players. You know, I, I focus a lot on the individual players and the matchups and all that stuff. It's kind of about what is the team's overall identity. It's it's why identity and, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Demeanor, I guess. You know, part of the problem with the Green Bay Packers in their final year with Mike McCarthy, it was the players, but it wasn't the players. And we learned that the next year when a lot of those players came back and they won 13 games. And granted, there was some overhaul. We got rid of some guys. We brought in some new guys. But a lot of it had to do with mentality. A lot of it had to do with a team that hated being on the team, hated everything, just everything. I mean, again, you had a team where they would go to the sideline after a touchdown and they wouldn't even celebrate. It drove me nuts. Aaron Rodgers and all these guys, they'd score a touchdown, they'd walk off to the sideline as though they just, you know, went three and out. Maybe the guy that scored a touchdown would do a quick Lambo leap and then run to the sideline, but it was just a super toxic, horrible environment. And and by the way, this is this is a big part of the reason why I say this, certain things about certain teams and why, why I get a feel for certain teams that I don't about other teams. The Bears and Vikings are very similar. And, and I do expect the Vikings to kind of wake up a little bit and kind of come back because they have too much talent on that team to stay down forever. Same with the Chiefs, by the way. But there's something getting into their heads. And there's a point at which you realize this is never going to work. Again, my mind's going back to the book, but I'm going to try to not reference that every five minutes. The Steelers are under no illusion. They can try to mask it. Uh, the fans may be under some kind of an illusion. The media may be not fully understanding, but the guys in the locker room know 100%. Big Ben, for example, understands 100%. He knows his body can't do this anymore. His head coach knows Ben can't do this anymore. They all know, having played on this team for quite a while, the ones that have, the difference in their old offensive line and this offensive line. They know this offensive line is terrible, and not one of the original dominant players is still on the team. Not one. They know that that the days of Antonio Brown and Juju at his peak are done and over with. Antonio Brown is gone. Juju is, he's checked out. I don't know what happened to him. Again, he went from a guy that was like respected in the community and was doing good things for everybody to apparently the fame went to his head. He decided he didn't need to practice anymore, didn't need to try anymore, didn't need to care anymore. And now he's not even the number one wide receiver on a pile, in a, amidst a pile of receivers that are just okay. And talk about a team that that doesn't even understand. I mean, it's very similar to the Bears in which they just they don't understand what's going on in their own team. They're clearly the leadership for the Steelers is in denial. They believe they have a real shot here. That's the only reason you would take Najee Harris in the first round. Do you not understand the dire situation your team is in? You're not going to win a Super Bowl this year. I'm sorry. I know you've had some really good defensive pieces. And I know there's a part of you that says, I just can't let this go. We're so close. We just got to give it a little bit more, but it's dead. You got to quit. You got to abort the mission. You got to turn around while you still have fuel in the chopper, man. Or you're never going to make it back. Turn around, tear it down, rebuild. You're not going to make it. And so you go out and get this first-round running back thinking he's going to work miracles for you. And what do they do? They lean on him because he's the only guy with any shred of talent on the entire team. But guess what? You can't run an entire team through a running back, especially a team with no quarterback and no offensive line. It's not going to work very well. Of course, you're going to win some games. Every team wins games. But this is this is pathetic. Then in the second round, we draft a tight end. Why? Because we, 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 we're, we're still going all in, man. We got... We got Big Ben, son. We got these great wide receivers. We got a good enough offensive line. If we just had a running back and a tight end to keep this thing going, with this defense, we could go all the way. This this is the stuff of delusion, and I'm fine with Steeler fans having some level of delusion. I'm not fine with a GM that doesn't know what he's looking at, that doesn't have the heart to look at Tomlin and the rest of these guys and say, listen, we tried, we failed, we got to start over. This is not working. And listen, maybe the GM's under some stress too, because this is the problem with a lot of teams. GM's jobs are on the line. And so going, forget going to Mike Tomlin, going to the owner. And look, Tolbert's been there forever, so you feel like he would have some level of security here. But maybe he just doesn't have it to go to to Art, the owner, and be like, look, dude, um, this isn't going to work, man. This is never going to work. We're never going to get there with this team. 
we got to go back to the fundamentals. We're going to have to do a mini rebuild. We're going to start gutting some people. We're going to start building places like offensive line, and we desperately need to find a quarterback. The only thing you're doing by bringing in Fryermuth and Najee Harris is giving a, a small boost to your offense, enough so that you probably will win some games that you shouldn't win. Let the team die. Go out and draft an offensive line. Go out and draft a tackle and then draft a guard. Try to get this offensive line ready. Fail miserably and see if you can squeak out a quarterback next year. You're still going to have Chase on the team. You're going to have an improved offensive line and hopefully you have a quarterback. And once you get that quarterback, we can start talking about it again, assuming the defense hasn't completely imploded. Unfortunately, it's it's not only just a matter of finding talent, it's about timing. And it's great that you've been able to build this great defense, but if you can't build a complimentary offense until the defense is gone, then you failed. And it's very difficult to do because you're only finding one or two good players a year maybe in the draft. And you're finding a, a truly elite player once every, what, five, six, seven, eight years? Like we're talking top five, top three type of player? A TJ Watt, a Jair Alexander, an Aaron Rodgers, depending on your franchise, I guess. For the Packers, it might be once every three. Devontae, Bakhtiari, Lindsley, Rodgers, Jair, possibly Aaron Jones. It's not an easy thing to do, but at the end of the day, the one thing that's completely unacceptable if you're trying to build a team is is not being able to fully assess the situation, and this is an embarrassment. And a lot of teams go through it, and I think that is the reason. It's, it's complete denial. It's probably a lot of pride admitting my efforts have failed and having to go to your boss and say, my efforts have failed, knowing full well that there's a chance that that means you're going to get fired. Again, this is the reason the Bears have done what they've done, and it makes me completely happy. And if you're an owner of a franchise, you need to make sure your GM knows full well your job does not depend on success as much as it depends on your ability to properly assess the situation. Meaning you should feel comfortable to me to tell me the absolute truth about this situation. Because the second I see that you can't properly assess this, the second I see that you come to me and describe this garbage, te- garbage team as being just a running back away, you're instantly fired. Because you no longer have any ability to be a GM. Because the, the, aside from talent evaluation, evaluation of, of, of other teams and their players, the most important thing you have to do is evaluate our team. And if you can't do that, you can't be here. And this, this team, you know, it, it, it's, it's weird because it's an anomaly because, they, again, they do have some good players. But this is an embarrassment. And it's sad, really, because the Steelers are a storied franchise kind of similar to the Packers. And they've been such a good team for so long. I mean, they're kind of similar to the Packers in that, you know, they haven't won, but they're still very, very good. They don't win as much as you would expect, considering they've had, you know, Ben, who's probably an underrated quarterback, or at least, you know, not anymore, but was. They've had just a, a, a crazy amount of talent, mostly offensive talent for so long. And, you know, they're perennial playoff guys, but, you know, it's just gotten to the point where, and again, this is great for us. But, you know, it, it, it's to me, it's deeper than just who's going to win this week. You got a team that is really seriously aspiring to win a Super Bowl. They're, they're just realizing what it takes, and they're building something, and they're growing towards something. And, and guys that are very, very talented are starting to hit their groove. They're starting to finally get there. The Steelers are not that team. The Steelers are a team that, You know, maybe there's a couple of guys in denial, but again, when you got Juju Smith-Schuster on the sideline after going undefeated halfway through last year and then start losing a bunch of games, he's over there doing like little TikTok dances before the snap. This is a team that is mentally checked out, and maybe that's a Mike Tomlin thing. Maybe this is the exact same situation that Mike McCarthy got himself in where everybody was much too comfortable and nobody wanted to fire anybody. You know, we don't, the, the GM's been there way too long. The head coach has been there way too long. And it's just gone stale and nobody cares anymore. Again, why is Big Ben Roethlisberger still there? Because they don't want to get rid of anybody. They didn't want to get rid of Antonio Brown. He forced himself off the team. They didn't want to get rid of Le'Veon Bell. He had to force himself off the team. They won't get rid of anybody. Their, their entire offensive line, when I'm sitting there saying, get rid of these guys. I know they're still good, but they're 33, 34 years old. You got to find new guys. They wouldn't do it. Eventually, these guys all just retired. I mean, not all, but it just... <sighs> It's just gone stale, man. And if you really want to know what this game is today, if you're really interested in knowing what is the, the, the core of the Packers and the Steelers Sunday game day, what, what is this? 
This is the 2018 Packers against the 2021 Packers. That's what this is. It's a stale franchise with a GM that's, that's you know, not at his peak, a, a head coach that's cashed it in, an owner that's not paying attention. You know, everybody gets mad at uh, Mark Murphy and the job he's doing. It was when Mark Murphy woke up and turned around and said, what is going on? We went 6-9-1, and one, turned around and saw everybody just sleeping, everybody with their feet up, everybody just not caring, and said, all right, you're all out of here. Get out of my face. And I think technically that started 2017. 2018 was the last dance for Mike McCarthy to wake up, and it got even worse. It went from 7-9 and nine to 6-9-1. and one. I understand the Rodgers injury, but still, it just that was the reality of what happened. And so at some point, the Steelers need to wake up. But ultimately, what we're worried about is today, and that's that's what we're talking about today. That is the state of the Steelers franchise. And and whatever doubt they had, whatever feeling that they may have had that maybe this is real, maybe we can bounce back. Listen, last year we went undefeated for such a long time. You know, I don't know what happened the second half of the year, but we, we fixed it. We're better. We're healthier. We're all these things. They come out this year, they beat Buffalo, they're feeling great, they're feeling strong, we can do this, we got this, we're a little hesitant because the offense kind of played like garbage, but Buffalo's defense is so good. We're going to be fine. We go up against the Raiders and lose, we go up against the Bengals and get annihilated 10-24. to That's 14 points, and they only scored 24 and won by 14. This is, this is a tragedy, and the fact that things got worse after the Raiders game shouldn't surprise anybody. By the way, those two were home games. It was the Raiders at home. They flew all the way from Las Vegas and got whooped on by the Raiders and then played a division rival at home and got absolutely embarrassed. Now they have to fly to Green Bay, Wisconsin and face a team that just beat the 49ers in San Francisco, a mentally and physically grueling exercise, and the Packers passed the test against a better quarterback, better offensive line, much better head coach, much better tight end, um, arguably better wide receivers when you consider Debo's there. You know, it, this team has two competent players, whereas the 49ers have one, but Debo Samuel is beyond competent. He's a very good wide receiver. I would say borderline comparable defensive line. Steelers are better, but comparable. Fred Warner is a linebacker that Aaron Rodgers has even hailed as being one of the best, if not the best linebackers. That's much better than what the Steelers have. The only thing I think the Steelers might have a little bit better is corners. And they don't have dominant quarters, corners, but they at least have competent corners, which is not what you can say about the 49ers. Otherwise, just about everything is better with the 49ers. This is a broken down team that has already begun essentially a teardown involuntarily, involuntarily, just by virtue of the fact of natural turnover. <laughs> natural turnover and... Um, no ability to draft any replacements. As the offensive linemen leave, who step up? Anybody good? No? Okay. When the wide receivers leave, is anybody there? Well, I mean, they've been taking a million swings at wide receiver, but none of them are really dominant football players. They're all decent. Corners, linebackers, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, it's beginning. And, and the team, again, has probably been in denial because they're, they're, they're football players, right? They're very competitive, and they believe that they can be the best. They know that they can be the best down in their bones, but they've been confronted with reality for back-to-back weeks, and now their quarterback is, is essentially a laughing stock. Their team is becoming a laughing stock. Nobody respects them. Nobody cares about them, and even the defense is going to start to suffer. As good as they might be, when you know that your efforts don't mean anything, because unless you can keep a team to under 15 points or 14 points or whatever, you're probably not going to win. Think about that. If the defense had kept all three teams to 18 points, they would still be one and two. If they, if, if they had kept all three teams to 10 points, they'd be 2-0 oh, and 1, and barely. You think that's not going to weigh down on, on your players, mentally and physically and emotionally? I mean, why, nobody wants to be there anymore. And again, we're, we're talking about two guys on this defensive line that are dominant football players, fine. But I also feel like this is a team, and, and again, they're football players, they're going to show up. They're going to be aggressive. They're going to be ready to play. They're going to be fired up. But they're, they're a team with a short fuse, in a sense. Their, their emotional fuse is very small. And it's not going to take very long. It's sort, of, it's sort of similar to taking the audience out of a take, you know, taking the audience out of a game. You know, it's very, very loud, and then you kind of smack the team around, and then they go quiet. I believe like this with the Steelers, like with any team, for the most part, I mean, sometimes we've seen it with the Packers, they just don't show up at all. But there's a part of them that believes that, you know, we're, this is going to be a great game. 
And then the first time that team goes down, and, and again, you got the Packers with their strategy of getting the ball first. We'll see if they want to do that. But you, if you're able to drive down the field and score a touchdown, how demoralized is the defense going to be? How demoralized is the offense going to be before they even set foot on the field to say, we can't keep pace with this? Our defense gave up a, a touchdown on the first drive? We're done. We're cooked. But again, maybe they come out and they're like, all right, we got this. Rah, rah, rah. I think it's 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 very important for the Packers to play fast and to, and to play strong early. Because I think you can just take their soul. Uh, here I go again. It's in the book a lot. But you can take their soul early. And I think that needs to be the goal. Because look, what we know as well as anybody is, is certain teams are mentally strong and certain teams are not. Certain teams, you know, Tom Brady, you'll never be able to take him out of a game, ever. He's never going to stop. He's never going to quit. So at the end of the day, when you play Tom Brady, regardless of the team he's on, you just have to keep bringing it for four quarters. You know, maybe pace yourself a little bit. For teams like the Steelers, and you know, the, pay, the, uh, the, the 49ers may have been kind of the same too, right? They're, they're a sort of mentally tough kind of team. They're going to come back. They're going to do all these things. The Steelers, though, now I, I don't know. But just by looking at the full picture, I think this is a team that is emotionally devastated, that at the end of the day has to find some other refuge because the idea of being a successful franchise and winning a Super Bowl and all that, that's already out of your head. And so they go home and they look at their money, They look at whatever else they got going on and they're like, I got a pretty good life. Everything's great with me. I just got to go out and keep doing what I can do and focus on me and blah, blah, blah. And then again, they get all the rah, rah stuff and we're going to go, we're going to show the world, right? Yeah, we beat Buffalo. We could beat the Packers. Now we're going to get our respect. But it's shallow. All of that is shallow. And you you can strip that from them very quickly. And then there's nothing left but despair. Every single one of these guys has got a shallow veneer of optimism. And I think what you're going to see is a is a is a game that, as it wears on, the 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 forty nine or the uh, Steelers slowly start to erode. They come out playing strong, playing fast, playing hot. Packer fans are mad. Oh, I thought you said Ben sucked. Thought, thought you said you just completed a pass. What what happened there? Everybody freaks out. Struggle to move against the defense, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Again, they still got that fake thing in their head. But slowly, as time wears on, and they realize that they don't really have what it takes, and they're not a good enough team to win in this league. They're going to start to deteriorate. They're going to start to fall apart. Anyways, we're going to take a break. Uh, Again, we're kind of winding down. I don't know when we're... I'm guessing we're going to pick the winner tomorrow, maybe after the game. I'm not sure for the Instagram giveaway. But head over to Instagram, Packernet Podcast, and uh, find the posts, follow the rules, et cetera, et cetera. You could win a signed Josiah DeGuara jersey. Thanks to Pristine Auction for that. Make sure you sign up at Pristine Auction. Use Packernet... uh, uh, yeah, Packernet as the uh, promo code or whatever it's called. If you want to support this podcast directly, patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy is the place to do it. I'm shooting for eight more patrons this month. I'm keeping my goals small because I want to actually hit one of my goals one of these days. <laughs> I've, I set way too lofty goals and never hit them. And let's be honest, that uh, that barbecue experience that I lost out on on the last day kind of broke my soul. So um, eight patrons would be great. Eight net patrons, by the way. We're shooting for 260. You can't get to 2,000 if you don't get to 260. <laughs> <laughs> Laughing at my own pain. Sad clown. Gym reference, anybody? All right, fine. Forget all of you. Uh, finally, and again, I'm brand new to this world, so maybe you guys can still kind of limp me along in this. Maybe I'm being stupid, but if you check the uh, description of this show or the, the show notes or whatever it's called, I did get a Bitcoin thing. I have Coinbase. So I think if you have Coinbase, you can donate using Coinbase. Otherwise, you need certain codes for different things. I gave codes my address for the most popular ones. So anyways, if if donating crypto is... Because I know there's a lot of people who message me and they're like, dude, you got to get into crypto. You got to do it. I'm killing it on crypto. It's like, all right. Well, if you don't have dollar dollars, but you got crypto dollars, now I've got a way that you can uh, get me involved in it. Maybe it's useless. I don't know. But if that's what you got, I'm here for it. I'm also just kind of excited to actually have... I think I actually... I do have Bitcoin because when I signed up at Coinbase, they gave me like $5 of Bitcoin. So I'm in it, man. I'm officially a, uh, a Bitcoiner, right? That's what the kids call it, something. I don't know. But anyways, if, if somebody knows what they're doing, can just look at the notes and see if I'm being an idiot or if I did that right, that'd be fantastic. Anyways, we'll take a break and we'll be right back. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from. 
including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place and you can get the app and try it out for yourself so go ahead and test drive u.s cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days that's u.s cellular built for us terms apply awards based on open signal independent data so go to uscellular.com for all the details This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. All right, let's talk some NFL football now, see what we got going on here. Um, I'm going to do this sort of live because I haven't placed any bets yet, and I do know that I'm very iffy on a lot of these games. There's a lot of um, a lot of things that concern me, because I have looked at it, but I haven't you know, done any official betting yet. And I've been doing great uh, the last few weeks because I was stupid the first week, and Rather than putting little bits of money on all the bets that I think make sense, I did that for everything except two games, the Packers and the, and the Vikings. I said 100% they're going to dominate, um, and then I, I lost all my money for the most part. But I'm slowly building it back up. If you want to get involved, head over to DraftKings, as you probably heard. I think they're still sponsoring. If not, then never mind. <laughs> I'm petty like that. Anyways, we'll go in order. Washington football team against the Atlanta Falcons. Washington is without St. Juiced. And their quarterback. Falcons are going to be without Russell Gage and uh, Marlon Davidson. Who cares? But I, I just I have a hard time ever betting on the Falcons at this point. This is another team that I mean I said it was it was the same year as the Packers. It had to have been 2018. I said they need to tear down as well, and they still have not done it. They still will not stop just continuing to move forward. I mean they did get a new head coach Arthur Smith, but uh, you know this this needs to be the year. We we I mean they, and they got rid of Julio, so maybe they are starting the process, but. Jeez, Louise there, jeezer, Louiser. I don't know what I'm talking about. But look, I mean, this this team is is kind of an embarrassment. They did beat the Giants, which I'm not going to say it surprised me because the Giants are really struggling, but they won against the Giants by three points. Otherwise, they played Tampa and lost 25-48. to They lost to the Eagles 6-32. to This is such an unbelievably bad football team. And the shocking thing here is they're not going to, they've played one good team, and that's Tampa Bay. Other than that, until week eight against Carolina, maybe it's the Saints in week nine, maybe they they they're not playing the Eagles, the Giants, Washington, the Jets, and Miami are the teams that they're playing so far. They should lose one game, and they're probably only going to win maybe two. They have the 29th ranked offense, the 30th ranked defense. Again, despite having played some pretty garbage teams, but I mean. <sighs> The only 
I don't know. I don't. I don't want to drag it out. But the, the only thing that seems somewhat competent is is Washington. Um, if you look at Washington's offense, they do have a good offensive line. Grady Jarrett's still pretty solid, um, but they've got a terrible defensive line. Uh, Washington has uh, Curtis Samuel, who's pretty solid, and Terry McLaurin, who's pretty solid against some pretty terrible corners. Um, they don't have linebackers. They don't have safeties. Washington is not great. Uh, Heineke is ranked 32nd out of 35 quarterbacks, but there's still something here. Again, he's got an offensive line, so they should be able to run the ball a little bit, and they got two competent wide receivers, so make it work. And on the other side, it's just garbage against garbage. However, the defensive line for Washington, um, Allen is the 7th-ranked defensive tackle. Payne is the 16th-ranked defensive tackle. Sweat is the 12th-ranked edge rusher. Young is 44th, but still a 68 overall uh, grade, which is not terrible, and everyone's focusing on how that's not good enough, and that's true, but you still got... 70, 76, 80, and 84 are your grades across this defensive line. Outside of Lindstrom at, at guard, the grades for the offensive line, 54, 61, 35, and 63. I can do math. <laughs> Matt Ryan, who I've been saying for a while is not the problem, suddenly became the problem 29th out of 35 with a 59 overall grade. Calvin Ridley, I can hear people scream, what about Calvin? He's good. 71st out of 102 wide receivers. He's not playing well. Um, there's nothing here. Now, Washington's pretty bad otherwise, and, and the one and a half line I'm fine with, and I'm not putting any money on this game, but I do think Washington wins the game, and I'm relatively comfortable with that. Detroit and Chicago, I think, is very interesting. Chicago is uh, three-point favorites, and I think, I think it, it, I'm very tempted to say the Lions win the game, and I know everyone's just going to say that it's just disrespect toward the Bears, and, and it is. But it's not diet, bias disrespect. You saw what happened against Cleveland, right? That was that was an embarrassment. And again, you're talking about mentality. And, and I think we've got two different teams. When I mentioned Vikings and Bears and not the Lions, it was for a reason. I think the Lions are doing things properly. The Lions know they're bad, but they also know that they're building towards something. They know th- th- this is like when you buy into a company on the ground floor. You know there's no revenue, right? You understand that. You 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 grasp that. But what you're trying to find are small victories. You're trying to see growth, right? Think of it in terms of starting a podcast. When you do a podcast and nobody listens, that's kind of expected. But then, you know, a week later, you've got, you know, 50 people listening. You know, you've been sharing it around with friends and family and a couple people picked it up searching for stuff. You know, Batman memorabilia podcast. Oh, there's one, (laughs) you know, 50 is nothing. But you acknowledge that and you recognize that, uh, you know, not even times because you can't it's 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 massive growth in a week and you're you're optimistic about that and and again if you're the lions you kind of look at that and say okay we're moving a little bit here and so as much as we want to look at this and say look the lions are probably the worst team in football or at least they're up there um with the worst teams in football first of all they've played the 49ers the packers and the ravens so when you look at it and say they've got the 31st ranked defense in terms of points they've played the 49ers the packers and the ravens And by the way, they only give up 19 points to the Ravens and almost beat the Ravens. And they almost beat the 49ers. And for a while, it seemed like they almost were going to beat the Packers until the Packers ran away with it. The Bears did have to face the Rams, but they also played uh, the Bengals and nearly lost. And then they played the Cleveland Browns and got annihilated. So they got annihilated by the Rams and the Browns and almost lost to the Bengals. This is the 31st ranked um, offense. And again, we we can say that it's some good defenses, kind of. Cleveland clearly overrated because they got nine sacks, which is 90% the Bears' fault, much more than the Browns being that good, because go find me the other game that where they got nine sacks. But on top of that, the, the bigger issue here is the fact that the defense is ranked 19th. If my, my biggest hang-up in this game is I don't think the Lions' offense can overcome the Bears' defense, regardless of how bad the Bears' offense is. They're going to find a little bit more success against this defense, which is terrible. Right, if if the Bears have any ability whatsoever, and by the way, they've only twenty points is the most points they've scored, which is not good. Twenty fourteen and six, that's abysmally bad. That's that's uh, yikes. In fact, let's have a little fun if I can figure out how to find this information. If you look since twenty ten, and and we understand how bad the Bears have been, right? We know how abysmally horrible the Bears have been. We laugh at them because of Trubisky and all the different things we've laughed at the Bears for over the years on offense in particular. This is the worst start they've had in 10 years, technically 12, I guess, (laughs) somehow. The next worst was 2016. They had 45 points to start the first three weeks. 
That year under John Fox, they went 13-3. and three. The only year in which they've done better since 2000, uh, since 2000 is uh, cheating. Because <laughs> in 2001, they somehow had a week three bye, which I didn't even think was a thing. So they didn't count the points for that week. So that doesn't count. we got to get rid of that. But they went 13-3 and three that year. But unfortunately, you are disqualified. Ooh, I'm sorry about that. Um, we've also got uh, 2003 Dick Duran. But, ooh, week three bye again. So you're disqualified. That was only seven and nine, by the way. Um, so since 2000, only one year did they start off slower. This was in 2007. They had 33 points scored in the first, um, wait, oh, also 2000, uh, 2000, so hold on, 2007, 33 points scored, they went 7-9 and nine with Lovey Smith, it's actually very similar to how they started this year, 3 points against San Diego, 20 against the uh, Chiefs, and 10 against the Dallas Cowboys, this has been 14, 20, and 6, very similar, and then in 2000, um, they scored 34, Four points, scoring zero against the Minnesota or the uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in 2000. They went five and ten. So seven wins is the best they've done, having done this poorly. Granted, seven wins is kind of par for the course for the Bears, anyways. This is also the fifth worst point differential they've had since 2000, negative 37. So it honestly, it's a very interesting game to me. On, on top of all that. I genuinely feel like this is the most important game for Justin Fields, right? Because he is officially the guy, right? And, and okay, he's had all the excuses. I get that, right? He's sacked a bunch of times. What can you really expect? Fine. Here's the thing. Detroit has the 31st ranked defense in terms of points. PFF has them as the 32nd ranked defense. Worst defense in football. Justin Fields needs to not only win this game, he needs to show, if when this game is done, Everybody needs to be saying, I told you so. I need all the Bears fans to be coming out of the woodwork saying, I told you so. Which, of course, I'm going to laugh a little bit because, again, it's the 32nd ranked defense. But this needs to be a, a showcase beyond showcase. I mean, if, if he can't do it against the Lions, he can't do it, period. There is no pass rush with the Lions. And if there is pass rush in this game, that's, that's not good. You shouldn't be seeing very much of that. Corners aren't good. Linebackers say, blah, blah, blah. Nobody's good on the defense. Nobody. Wide receivers should be open. Quarterback should have time. They should be able to establish the run, and I have a feeling they're going to run a lot in this game because, <laughs> again, I don't think I don't think the coach likes Justin all that much. Not as a person, I mean as a as a competent football player. But again, all these numbers are kind of funny numbers because both teams have gone up against fairly good competition, and the Lions have gone up against some really good competition, and they've shown heart. That's the thing. And so when you look at mentality index, if I were to make up a fake thing. The Lions have shown heart against three of the t- three top tier teams. The Bears, I feel like, have been embarrassed. It'd be a funny t shirt. Embarrassing, but spell it B E A R. Anyways, I wouldn't wear it. I'm just saying it's funny. By the way, speaking of no pass rush, Trey Flowers is out. If there was any pass rush, it's from Trey. He's out. There's no, there's just, there's zero excuses. Zero. The Bears, the only guy that I see out is uh, Joel Iagubamungwe. You know that song, ooh, 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 it's that. What, whatever they say at the end, that's his name. Literally, that's I-Y-I-E-G-B-U-N-I-W-E. I think his dad wrote that song. Anyways, doubtful as Deshaun Gibson. Okay, who cares? To be fair, though, Cleo Mack is questionable. I'm pretty sure he's playing, but uh, I should probably get a status update on that. <laughs> Mooney is also questionable. Xavier Crosbert's question. Andy Dalton is out. Searching on Twitter, and it's just a bunch of Bears fans begging Adam Schefter and Ian Rappaport to give them a status update on Khalil Mack, and nobody's done so. So I'm assuming he's playing, but I don't know, man. I'm, I'm, I'm not touching it, and the Bears should win. Should. They should be able to shred this defense, and the Bears' defense should be more than capable of containing this, this offense. This should be a slaughter by the Bears. The fact that it's three points... For the Bears is not ideal for the Bears. So I'm going to say the Bears do win. Um, I'm going to say they should win fairly handily. But I'm also going to say it's not going to surprise me even a little bit if the Lions keep it close or even win. Tennessee and the Jets, who cares? Tennessee's a lot better, should win. Way to go. Um, Am I going to put money on it? No, maybe. We'll come back to that. It's minus six. Mm. So the Jets... (laughs) 
The Jets' offense scored 14, then 6, then 0. So, I mean, you want to talk about a mentality problem. 32nd ranked offense. The only reason the Bears are looking good right now is because of the Jets. Thanks a lot. Um, defense hasn't been horrible, but, I mean, they played the Panthers, Patriots, and Broncos. They're all, they're all like, maybe good teams, but I'm not really sure. Patriots, probably not as much. Tennessee, I feel like, is sort of the opposite. I know their defense isn't good, but, I mean, they had 13 points to start and then scored 33 and 25. Pending injuries, let's see. Julio Jones is out with a hamstring. Um, Caleb Farley is out. A.J. Brown is out. Jeez. Uh, Brett Kern, their punter, is out. And Bud Dupree is out. Jeez, Louise. The Jets lost Marcus May. That's massive. Um, Jeff Smith and Elijah Moore is pretty big. Um, and then they got a pile of questionables here with Jamison Crowder, LaMichael P. Ryan, and Tyler Croft. Man, if it wasn't for those injuries for the Titans, I'd be very tempted. I know Derrick Henry's still playing. I don't know. We'll, we'll circle back to that, but Titans should win that game fairly easily, and I, I six points is not that much, and I could buy back some points if I was worried about it. Cleveland and Minnesota. Um, only minus one for Cleveland. That kind of surprises me. I thought they would have uh, be bigger favors than that. Obviously, Minnesota gained a little bit of respect this last week. But, I mean, you know, Cleveland got nine sacks against the Bears, you know, 26-6, to six, so it's pretty good. I don't know. I mean, you can tell by the way I talk about the Vikings. I have some level of respect for them. Um, they, they just scare me too much with, you know, their, their quarterback is capable. Their wide receivers are scary. Dalvin, I don't think, is playing, though. Pretty sure that's what I just saw come across. Oh, Dalvin is playing. Excuse me. So Dalvin is expected to play, so that matters. And this is in Minnesota, which is it's a pretty tough place to play um, in that in that dome, the noise, the stupid horn, which I know I'm supposed to hate, but I still think that thing's pretty cool, man. I, I, I have to Packer fans have to be lying about that, right? Tell me that isn't the most ominous thing ever. When that team is like got you up against the ropes, the stadium is just screaming, and you hear that horn, which just sounds like some demonic growl from hell. It's intimidating. I wish we had something like that, but we don't. I've gone over this several times, but I just, I, I seriously think Packer fans are lying when they say that the horn is stupid because they hate the Vikings, which is fine. We'll keep that between us, but dude, that just sends chills down my spine. But I mean, if you, if you look at PFF's ELO ranking, whatever, Massey ranking, um, they have the defenses ranked. Uh, Cleveland is fifth. The Vikings are 18th. Offense, Cleveland is second. Vikings are 10th. Overall, Cleveland is 7th, Vikings are 20th. And, and again, maybe it's just a matter of the Vikings got off to a slow start and they kind of just figured it out and they're coming strong, but I don't know, man. Uh, Newsom, the rookie, is out. Treader, Taki Taki, Willis, questionable. Uh, Hubbard is out. That's kind of a lot when you talk about Willis being questionable, Hubbard being out. Offensive line, I don't know. Vikings have a ridiculous amount of people on their injury report, but pretty much all of them are playing. I'm tempted to take Cleveland, but there's a. It's painful enough to have Washington beat Cleveland. To lose money on it would just be worse. And I could go Vikings, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want to just donate money just for the sake of feeling good about life. I want to make good decisions, so I'll probably just stay away from that. Colts in Miami, I mean, I just, I don't care. They both kind of suck. Uh, Quentin Nelson is out. Yikes. Uh, Braden Smith, the tackle, is also out. Uh, Kari Willis, the safety is out. Quiddy Pay, the defensive end is out. And Rocky Sin, the corner is out for the Colts. For the Dolphins, the only big guy out is Michael Dieter, the center. So that's, I mean, Quentin Nelson alone is pretty massive. But, um, man, Miami, holy cow. I mean, Brissett is in. Brissett is definitely playing better. And they do have some decent wide receivers, but this offensive line is so bad. But what is, what are the Colts going to do about it? They don't have anybody. The corners are about as bad as I've ever seen. Xavier Rhodes, and uh, Kenny Moore are playing just horrific, probably because there's no pass rush and they got to cover for 45 minutes. On the other side, Wentz is fine. Hines is fine. Pittman is fine. Doyle is fine, the tight end. <sighs> it's just it's just bad against bad. I don't know. I think this Miami defensive line might be able to do some work against this offensive line. Um, three of these guys are just horrific. And again, without... Um, Without uh, their main guard playing, obviously, it's going to be problematic. And they do have pretty good say. I think Miami might win the game. But again, you look at the line, minus two and a half, it's kind of it's how I'm feeling. Go figure. They, they know what they're doing. 
I don't know, man. Do whatever you want. I don't want to. I, I knew. I, I knew when I looked at these. I'm like, I'm not going to put money on any of these because they're just they're too scary for me. Um, Carolina Panthers and the Dallas Cowboys again, exact same thing. I don't trust either of these teams. I'm not buying Carolina. I'm not buying Dallas. The fact that Dallas has favored it in this is hilarious because everybody's been pumping up Carolina so much. Are you seriously telling me that this supposedly really dominant team all of a sudden Carolina with this great defense and a resurgent quarterback and all that they're minus or they're they're plus four against Dallas I mean really I mean 14 points seven points and nine points is all this defense has given up second ranked defense in terms of points number one in terms of yards I mean that's it's impressive I don't know how they're doing it because I remember last year they didn't have anybody on defense maybe everybody just suddenly woke up I don't know maybe it's because the Jets and the Texans are two of the teams they played and the Saints were always kind of a fraud Maybe that has something to do with it. Dallas has got a two-game win streak. Uh, they barely lost to Tampa Bay. They beat the Chargers 20-17 to and annihilated the Eagles 41-21. So, again, it's just I don't know what these teams are. I don't. I have no idea. Are, are they actually good, or did you just beat up on the Eagles because it's the Eagles and they're a common opponent and it's the Eagles? Again, Carolina, the offense isn't impressive. 19-26-24, and 24, that's kind of embarrassing. But defensively, that's a heck of a start. But they've also played some garbage teams. So I don't, I don't know. I'm not... I don't want to touch it. In terms of who do I think is going to win, I mean, the Dallas offensive line is starting to look like the old offensive line from a few years ago. Guys are playing real well. Dak is doing fine. Schultz, their tight end, somehow is number two overall. Again, a lot of this is inflated because they've gone up against garbage, but um, Pollard is the number one running back in football. Yeah, right. I feel like both of these teams are going to set themselves right. I feel like this offense is going to kind of correct the defense, but also this defense is going to correct the offense. I don't think Pollard is going to be the number one running back. I don't think um, Dalton Schultz is going to be the number two tight end in football come the end of the. I don't think Shaq Thompson for the Panthers is going to be the third highest graded um, linebacker in football. This is just two teams that have really done better than their ability, and I think that that's going to change. But how it ends when it comes down to it, if. I mean, the the more concerning thing is when you look at the guys that you know are the core players, they're not as good as you would expect. Aside from Tyron Smith and Zach Martin, who you know are good football players along the offensive line, Dak Prescott is ranked 20th. CeeDee Lamb is 15th. Amari Cooper is 44th. These are the guys that when the dust settles, these are the guys you need playing well. And the guys that you need playing well are not playing well. Ezekiel Elliott is ranked 27th with a 68 overall grade. So again, I'm not really buying it. I feel like there's a lot of overinflation here, probably more so for the Cowboys than the Panthers, because the Panthers aren't grading out super well. They're just apparently executing against garbage teams, which, you know, again, when you go up against a good team, you don't execute as well. On the flip side, um, they decided to make Micah Parsons an edge rusher instead of a linebacker, and that has worked incredibly well so far again maybe it's fake I don't know but he's the seventh best edge rusher in football right now um and as far as the Panthers I mean Darnold is playing well Moore is a good wide receiver the offensive line isn't good tight end isn't good the other wide receivers aren't good running back isn't good McCaffrey's out by the way that's why I'm saying the running back isn't good I don't know I I think I'm going to give it to Dallas just because they actually have some talent I don't really buy into the Panthers at all I think Dallas is going to win and again they're minus four I could just buy the points back and just do minus one and say that they win, but I don't know. Uh, The Giants and the Saints. Saints are seven-point favorites because the Giants are garbage. I don't know what else to tell you. I'm not touching it because it's minus seven. I'd be inclined to take the Giants because I just hate lines that are that big, but Saints are going to probably win that game. Uh, Chiefs-Eagles, I think, is incredibly interesting. I think the Chiefs are going to win, and they're going to win big. Um My thought on the Chiefs, again, kind of sticking with mentality here, and I've been talking about this since like mid last year. Um, It's just a matter of you look at the quality of talent on the team, and it's not as high as their production, which means they're they're priced too high. In other words, sell. On top of that, the drafting had been terrible. And what you know about drafting is if you don't draft well, the erosion is, it's delayed, but it's coming. When you look at the drafting, and you see that they're not getting any hits, what you know is going to happen is that the guys who are really good, Travis Kelsey, by the way, is like 32 years old. Um, These guys start to leave, and there's nobody to take their place, which means the erosion is going to keep coming. It's already happening. It started last year. I started talking about it. Their biggest loss ever was to the Raiders, I think, early on, which was, at the time, it was staggering and and a a good thing for the Chiefs because I thought it was like eight points. It's amazing that in... Um, Pat Mahomes' entire tenure, eight, eight points is 
the most they've lost by. And then they went on to lose more, and then they lost more, and then they started to get embarrassed, and then guys started getting hurt, and you started to see the weaknesses, and you started to see, you know, again, it's sort of that 300 thing where, you know, even a god king knows he can bleed or whatever the line is. The point is he realizes he's a human being. They realize they're mortal. They're not immortal. They're not God. And that they can lose, and they can lose bad, and they can get embarrassed. And they did. And they've come back so far this year, and they've kind of been embarrassed. This is not anything Pat Mahomes has ever faced, ever, as, as far as being a pro. Kansas City Chiefs are 1-2. and two. Obviously, they have not faced that with Pat Mahomes uh, on board. Um, they did only lose by six, so they still haven't lost like a big loss yet, but it's to the Chargers and to the Ravens, and you know, the Ravens went on the next week to get embarrassed, almost lose to the Lions, for crying out loud, so um, the only team they've beat, and it was by four points, is Cleveland. Um, and so this is one of those things where now they're a little bit low, you know, whereas before you want to sell, now would be a time to buy on the Chiefs. Now, if they lose, they're cooked. The Philadelphia Eagles are not good, and this is on the road and all that, but I feel like they still have, I mean, they still got Pat Mahomes and Tyreek and all, all these guys that are still really good. And I think I think this is a team that that's going to get their footing. Um, they know that they're good. They're a little rattled, and it's going to continue to erode. But you're going to see, it's kind of like um, the season change, you know? You get around this time of the year, at least in Wisconsin, and you'll get this one week where it just plummets and it's freezing. And it's like, oh, no, it's, it's here. It's time. It's going to start snowing. It's cold. And then you're going to get a blast of like 90 degrees. And it's like, what the heck is this? Like, oh, yeah, we're not, uh, we're not officially done yet. You know that the season is coming. Fall is coming. The leaves are going to fall. Eventually there's snow. Then it's going to be winter and life is miserable for what feels like about a year and a half. Eventually, the collapse of Kansas City is coming, but I feel like this, what we're seeing right now, is just sort of that first week of kind of cold weather. You know, you can't see your breath, but it's like, oh man, I might need like a little coat or something, or a long sleeve. I don't know. I don't like this. It's too cold for a t-shirt, but I don't know if I want to wear anything. Plus, it's going to heat up later. I don't know. It sucks. Plus, it, plus, you know you're being a coward because it's still like 65 degrees, and if it, if it was January and suddenly heated up to 65 degrees, you'd be sitting outside with no shirt on in a lawn chair. Like, dude... This is the hottest day I've ever experienced. So you're like, I'm not wearing a coat. It's 65 degrees. I'm not, what am I, a Floridian? But again, you get that burst. I mean, after that, when you feel like it's going to be cold from now on, all of a sudden it's 90 degrees. And it's like, oh, geez, this is ridiculous. I think we're going to get a 90 degree day from Kansas City. I think they're going to beat the Philadelphia Eagles and they're going to annihilate the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, and they're going to try to reassert their dominance. And, and it's going to work short term. Unfortunately, they play the Buffalo Bills after this, so they I don't know if they're going to win against them or not. They may, they may not. I don't know. Cross that bridge when we come to it. But this is an opportunity for them to prove to everybody, including themselves, that they still got it, and not only win, but win big. And I think they will win very, very big. I told you before, I don't like taking uh, super big lines. They have the Chiefs at six and a half. I'd be tempted to take the Chiefs. I just feel like they're going to put everything... And, and their goal is to not just win, but to win big. I feel like if they're up by like 14, they're going to step on the gas. Houston and Buffalo, oh my goodness. This is, I got to take the under on this. Buffalo, 17 and a half points. 17 and a half. I remember seeing a stat one time about how like this never happens, and then the, when, when they were talking about how lines like this are stupid because it never happens, they actually went, I think it was like the Patriots or something, and ended up going over on a line like this. But I got to look it up real quick. I know this podcast is going on forever, but I'm curious. So um, looking at it, it looks like it is most of the time you can expect to to cover. And I put it in at 17 and a half. So in other words, they don't reach the 17 and a half. So uh, the amount of times taking the under would make the more, however you phrase it, whatever they cover, uh, 25 out of 36 times since they've been tracking this, which is, I guess, fairly close to, what is that, two thirds or something? Yeah, it's about two-thirds of the time uh, they don't quite reach that. There were actually two last year. Once was Rams and Jets. Um, the line was 17 and a half, just like this. Uh, the result, though, was 23 to 20, and the Jets actually won. <laughs> the Jets beat the Rams. The Rams were expected to win by 17 and a half, and the Jets won. Um, it's funny how the, the, uh, the last couple times this has happened. The other time was against Kansas City, and uh, it was not covered, and this is by the Jets, I guess always the Jets, uh, 9 to 35. But um, I just don't trust the Bills enough, I think is the problem. It's not that I like Houston necessarily, but I don't trust the Bills enough. I would I would be willing to bet. I'm, I'm tempted to take Houston in this. Let me see what they've done so far. 
So Buffalo is two and one, and they've they've we talked about it already. They came out of the gate hot. They've been smashing people, and Houston's lost the last two, but they beat Jacksonville. They were they lost by ten to Cleveland. They lost by twenty five or fifteen, excuse me, against Carolina. I don't know. I probably shouldn't touch it. It's tempting though. It's tempting because that line is just stupid. Whatever. Um, Arizona Cardinals, L.A. Rams. As you know, I'm just I'm not in on the Rams. However, starting to become a believer, and I'm also just I don't know. I'm so, that's the thing. It's the more that things happen, the less sure I am about it. We're still way too early in the season. It's hard to get a beat on anybody because everybody's had crazy games. And it's like, well, is that the real one or is the stupid one over there the real one? I don't know. And then some guys are like killing it right now. And it's like, oh man, maybe that's legit. And then you look at other guys that are killing it like Pollard. And it's like, all right, no, we're still in stupid territory. So I don't know anything right now. Rams are minus four. This is a divisional game. So history maybe would be relevant to look at here. And uh, it is relevant to look at here, as I suspected. Since 2017... The Rams are 8-0 against the Cardinals. 8-0. So, (laughs) the last time the Cardinals have won back-to-back against the Rams was 2014. They won two games. Uh, Since 2015, the Cardinals have won twice. Man, look, I know Chandler's having a good good time of it, and I don't know how much longer that's going to hold up, but... I mean, this is a this is a team that does not really have a whole lot of weakness. Stafford is top ten. Um, offensive line is not elite, but solid across the board. Um, Woods is off to a slow start, but uh, presumably he's going to get better. Cooper Cup is third. Again, that may um, correct itself a little bit, but as he comes down, Woods probably goes up a little bit. Um, looking at the defense for the Cardinals, and again, I don't like the defense. Everybody loves their defense, and I don't know why. Probably because J.J. Watt and Chandler Jones and everybody thinks that Isaiah Simmons is a good football player, although he is getting a little bit better. Uh, Buddha's not terrible, but he's not great. Um, I mean, J.J. Watt is not doing anything right now. He's uh, ranked 27th, which is like the worst he's done basically ever. 12 pressures is pretty solid, but he has zero sacks on the season. Um, tons of missed tackles. Well, not ton, but way too many. He has a 26 tackling grade three missed tackles. It's three games, man. I don't know, man. I just, I don't trust their defense. I think the Rams are going to kind of pick. I mean, it's kind of like the 49ers, you know? I mean, they're very schemey, and if you're not on on the ball, and and they're just, they're too intelligent to have, like, one guy just wreck you, you know? They're going to be able to scheme and and make sure that that's not as much of a problem. On the flip side, um, I mean, the, the Rams are still the Rams. I don't necessarily care for their defense, but they're not doing terrible. Aaron Donald is still a freak. Uh, Ramsey's having a good year, although his supporting cast is not as good this year. Um, and really, it's just Kyler Murray and Christian Kirk and a little bit of uh, Max Williams that are making this offense go. Everybody else is terrible. And this offensive line, dude, Floyd's kind of stepping it up. Aaron Donald, I mean, I don't know. I, I think the Rams got this. But again, they're minus four, so I don't want to touch it. I don't care. It's too close of a call. And uh, I don't know. 49ers Seahawks, again, divisional deal, so that's kind of iffy. The 49ers, it's kind of, both of these teams are too iffy to me. I don't, you know, I went on my tirade last week about the 49ers and why I don't think that they're as good as everyone's making them out to be, but Seattle's been Seattle, the same version of Seattle that they still seem competent, but they have way too many holes. I mean, for what, five years now? Um, I just, I don't know. It could, it could easily go either way. Both teams have some serious strengths. Both teams have some serious weaknesses. I hate week four, man, so much. I've never had it like this before where I go through every game and just go, yeah, I don't know, it's crazy. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> the 49ers did just have their first loss, and it was close. I mean, they they won if it wasn't for a miracle at the end of that game with Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams, and Mason Crosby just dominating for 37 seconds. Seattle's got two losses in a row. Again, they, they just keep slowly getting worse and worse a little bit every year. This is, again, this is how I expect the Chiefs to die out. It's going to be a 10-year slow bleed. And uh, you, usually the Seahawks start kind of hot and then fade, um, I think, or it's the other way around. I guess I don't remember, but um, this is not great. They beat the Colts fairly handily. Um, they barely beat the Titans in overtime and then they got just dominated by the Minnesota Vikings. I think the 49ers are going to win. Let me just look at their history. Seahawks have kind of had them on the ropes, though. Um, although, again, the 49ers have been kind of terrible. Um, but even so, I mean, in 2019, they were they split. 
Um, the Seahawks beat them 27-24. It's always kind of close, too, 21-26. And then last year, 2020, I'm so confused. They played them once last year. Why did they play them once last year? Oh, because the second one was in January. Okay, it's, I got it. So technically, they went they lost twice to the Seahawks last year. But even that second game with San Francisco not being great, it was 23-26. So, I mean, this is this is like old-school Packers-Bears rivalry. Um, going back to what would that be? Early 2010s, I guess? I don't know. But you know when it was like you never really knew. You, sometimes the Bears were better, not usually, but sometimes. But the Packers would still win. Sometimes the Packers are better and the Bears would still win. It was a weird thing. And even so, like the Packers would win a certain way. And then when you play the Bears, it's like a, it's like you're watching a completely different team. I feel like that's kind of what they've got going on with this little rivalry here. 49ers are favorited, but I don't know, man. I'm tempted to take the Seahawks just because of the history. I mean, if if they split when the 49ers are at their best, and the 49ers are not at their best, again, this is not the 2019 49ers. I don't know. I'm not touching it, but I'm tempted to say the Seahawks win this game. Uh, Baltimore and Denver. I, 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 I... I want so desperately to say Baltimore is going to just destroy Denver because I don't buy Denver. I, I, I think they're overrated. But Baltimore, what the heck is Baltimore now? I don't know what's going on with Baltimore. Plus, is Lamar playing? Looks like he is expected to play. All right, so he's hurt. He's going to play. But Ronnie Stanley is out. That's pretty massive. Derek Wolf is out. Graham Glasgow for the uh, Broncos is out. I don't know, man. I just I just want the Broncos to get beat so bad because I'm so sick of them. I don't know why. I, I just, I was the one saying that this is a better team than people are saying, and now they're winning and everyone's like, dude, Broncos are pretty good. I'm like, no, they're not. And again, they, they're they 3-0 and and the defense has given up 13-13-3. and um, Their offense has only scored 27-23-26 and and that's not great. They've played the Giants, Jaguars, and Jets. Who's had an easier schedule at this point? What t- what team is missing in terms of garbage teams? They didn't play the Giants. They didn't play the Falcons. But I mean, that's oh, they did they did play the Giants. The Falcons, maybe. I don't know. I don't know who's the worst teams in football that they haven't faced yet. The Lions, I guess. This is the easiest schedule, and we're going to give them credit for this. No chance. Baltimore, on the other hand, is coming off two weeks ago beating the Kansas City Chiefs. So. Um, yeah, I think Baltimore wins. I'm, I'm tempted to put money on it just because this is stupid. In fact, I'm going to do that right now. Not much. Again, we're doing a slow rebuild here, but yeah, we're doing this. That's one of those that might not be entirely rational. It's more emotional, but I'm fine with it. Next up, Packers Steelers. Packers are going to win. Minus six is uh, fair. Am I going to put money on that? No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm all about bravado in this episode, but i um, not going to put my money on that. And then finally... Yeah, finally, Buccaneers, Patriots. Buccaneers are going to annihilate the Patriots. That's the bottom line. Tom Brady's going to go back, and for a guy that plays like he's had a chip on his shoulder every day for the last 500 years, he's going to have an even bigger chip on his shoulder than he's probably ever had. Um, I know the Patriots know Tom, but Tom knows the Patriots, and um, I don't know. I This is another one where the, the line is minus seven. I would be tempted to take the Buccaneers with that just because I think Tom is going to go in similar to the Chiefs mentality. He's going to go in and he's probably because he basically runs the entire franchise. He probably talked to everybody and said, just so you know, talking to the head coach, he went into the coaches meeting and sat at the head of the table, you know, as is his seat probably. And said, just so you know, we're not going to beat the Patriots. We're going to embarrass the Patriots. We're going to annihilate the Patriots. If they don't win by 15 points or more, I'll be shy. In fact, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm putting I'm going against my own advice I'm going to put. I think I might do the the Chiefs, too. I'm going to do the Chiefs and the Buccaneers, and that'll be it. And I don't feel good about any of my bets today, but I'm, I'm going to stand on my convictions here. I just feel like this is going to be a bad week. But anyways, we're going to leave it at that. We're not going to talk about the Monday game, and i got to get the heck out of here. You folks have yourselves a great day. Stay tuned for um, some after party. Actually, I would like to do a pre-stream. We'll see how that goes. So uh, tune in before the game. We're going to talk about the game. Afterwards, I'm going to be working with uh, Brady. He's going to be streaming. If you want to hang out, um, check out his page at uh, Green Bay Packer Nation. And then after that, I may do my own stream. We'll see kind of how long that goes and uh, gauge interest and whatnot. But that's that'll be that's my plan right now. So it's it's three streams in a podcast today. Well, technically four because I'm doing the so four things. Three streams, two podcasts today. It's going to be a busy day. 
Packers better win. That's all, that's all I know. But you guys have yourselves a fantastic day. I will hopefully be talking to you uh, later today. Have a good one. Bye-bye. <laughs>